We're right in the middle of this sermon series called One Hit Wonders. I consistently called the, used the term one shot wonders last week to the point that the whole staff spent the whole week teasing me about it. But I want to say, look, it was, your, it was your title. If you want me to come up with the title, I'll remember it better. But it was kind of a collaborative effort on the title. And um, I see Stephanie Reed over here. She preached the first one, Stephanie Reed Meyer. And she did a, a great job. We picked four, um, we've picked four miracles of Jesus that are a bit unusual. And the reason is we're approaching this from a particular angle. I, this is a little bit redundant from last week, but there are three reasons, I think, if you read through the Bible, three reasons that Jesus did miracles. One was just out of sheer compassion. Jesus loved people. He was compassionate towards people. And he was called and pleased to relieve suffering when he could. We all would do that if we could, wouldn't we? Uh, the other reason Jesus did uh, miracles was as a sign of God's power. When you read the New Testament, you um, find in the Gospel of John, John called them signs. They were signs in which Jesus, by performing a miracle, was revealing God's power and revealing himself as the Son of God. But the third reason I'm totally convinced that Jesus did miracles is because people were surrounding him, the disciples and others. And Jesus used miracles as teaching moments. We don't all have the advantage of receiving a miracle. We can't perform miracles, most of us, but we can learn from miracles. And I think every one of the miracles of Jesus are teaching moments where we learn something about ourselves, we learn something about God, and we learn something about our relationship with God. And especially the four we picked today is an extraordinary miracle because it's a story about an encounter that Jesus has with a man who is sick in which Jesus really doesn't do anything at all. Well, let me back up. He does one thing. He asks a question. And so it's from the fifth chapter of John. Let's read this together. I'll read it. You just read along. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew, Bethesda. You hear this uh, pronounced in different ways, Bethesda, Bethesda, uh, of course, which has in the, and it has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. We don't really know what the diagnosis was, what was wrong with this particular man, but you can see that there are all sorts of maladies that are represented there. One man there who had been ill, one man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, sir, notice that he doesn't give him a direct answer. He punts on this. He says, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat, and walk. And at once the man was made well, and he took up his mat, and he began to walk. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The phrase Groundhog Day has become a cultural icon in modern America. I think almost everyone knows what Groundhog Day is and what it is referring to. I myself don't see very many movies. I, I at least, I watch a movie occasionally at night at home, but I don't like going to a theater. I'm an outdoor person. The idea of spending a couple of hours in a dark theater as opposed to being outside doesn't appeal to me. So I, I'm pretty sure the last movie I saw was No Country for Old Men, which was about 10 years ago. It's, it's because I love Cormac McCarthy. I've read nearly every Cormac McCarthy book, and so I saw oh, Country, No Country for Old Men. But even I have seen Groundhog Day. I assume that most of you have seen Groundhog Day. It's about a man who relives the same day. It happens to be Groundhog Day over and over and over again. The nightmare of living the same day over and over again. The interminable alarm clock, which just keeps going off. And every morning he realizes he's waking up to the same day, the same routine, the same bore, uh, boring, ordinary aspects of life. He can't shake the routine of life. 
And of course, deep down, the movie has a pretty powerful meaning, the way in which we can allow our lives to fall into a routine that at some point just simply has no meaning whatsoever. We just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Well, when you read this fifth chapter in the Gospel of John, you read about the original Groundhog Day. I think those of us who have read the Bible quite a bit through the years, it's so easy for us to look at a passage like this that we've read before, and you kind of you zip through it, you know, and you don't think much about it. But think about what this passage would be like if you were reading the Bible for the very first time. And you came to this passage, and you read with some sensitivity about a man who is ill or thinks he is ill, and he's been living Groundhog Day every day, for 38 years. Think about this man on his pallets laying there by the pool and the alarm clock goes off every morning and every day he looks for somebody to put him into the pool. The pool is rumored to have healing powers. It's not kind of like your jacuzzi. Whenever it would boil up, start, you know, the water would become disturbed, people would get in it because it, people claimed that it had healing powers during that time. And so when Jesus comes along and he asks the man what's going on, this is what he says. Look, I really want, you know, I, every time I try to get into the pool, somebody gets ahead of me. And I can't find anyone to help me get down there. The man has become a victim, you might say, of his own passiveness. Now, if you're reading the New Testament for the first time and you started with the first gospel, Matthew, you went to Mark and then to Luke, and you're reading for the first time, by the time you got to this fifth chapter in John, you will have read about a lot of miracles from Jesus. Reaching out and healing the lepers, touching the man as he did last week, touching the man on the eyes, giving him sight, commanding the evil spirit to come out of a man. And so you're used to Jesus and the remarkable spiritual power that Jesus has to heal other people and to relieve suffering. And so if you're reading this for the very first time, you would think that this, you know exactly what Jesus is going to do. He's going to reach out and touch this man, or he's going to order the evil spirit to come out of this man. He's going to do something extraordinary in order to relieve the suffering of this particular man. Instead, Jesus does nothing. This man makes his excuse. He says, every time I try to get into the water, people get in front of me. I can't get anybody to help me. You know what he's asking. He's asking Jesus, will you finally be the one who will help me get down into the water and get healed? And Jesus refuses to take the bait. He asks this man, what was arguably the most important question he had ever been asked in his life. He said, do you really want to be made well? Two different kinds of people in life, those who are too passive and those who are too active, those who become victims of their own overactivity and those who become victims simply because they are unwilling to do anything to help themselves. Jesus refuses to take the bait. He says, do you really want? With the emphasis, I think, do you really want to be made well? When I was a boy growing up, I loved sports. I loved team sports. I, I liked baseball. I liked basketball even more. I liked football even more. Love sports, but I was always an average athlete. I played high school football, and I've, I've told you this before. If you play high school or, or college football, I didn't make it to college, believe me. If you play high school football, you can be slow and fast, or you can be big and slow, but you can't be small and slow. That's what I was. I was small and slow. So I, I, I was never very good at any of those sports, but I love sports nevertheless. 
And as I look at, back over my life, there are certain moments that are, that are really just unforgettable learning moments for me. And one involves my father. During all the years that I played Little League Baseball and, and Church League Basketball, and then on through junior high school basketball, and then high school football, I don't recall, I don't think that my father ever missed a single game. And so he sat through all of those games from the time I was in the fourth or fifth grade all the way through the time I was a senior in high school. He sat through the, all of those games watching his son perform at a rather average level in terms of athletic skill. But in all of those years, all of those years, he never criticized me but one time. And I'll never forget it. It was a baseball game and I got up I batted left-handed, and I took three, strike, took three strikes in a row. If you don't know baseball, taking a pitch means not swinging at it. And I got up there, the pitcher threw a strike at me. I stood and watched it. He threw a second strike. I watched it. I threw a th he threw a third strike right in the middle, and I watched it. The umpire called me out. And I'll never forget what happened. That night we got into the car and we were driving back home. I don't remember whether we won the game or lost it, but I'll never forget what my father said. He turned to me and he said, son, I don't care if you strike out every time you ever get to the plate. It won't bother me a bit. But don't ever do that again. If you go down you go down swinging. That was a pivotal learning moment for me. I think that's kind of what Jesus was getting at with this man. He refused to take the bait. This man wanted somebody to do the work for him. He wanted somebody to rescue him. And Jesus wanted this man to discover his own inner power. He wanted to discover the resources which God had planted inside of him. He says, do you want to be made well? I think it's one of the most powerful stories in all of the New Testament. And of course it's powerful because it's a story about you and me, isn't it? All of these stories are stories about you and me and what we learn when we come into relationship with Jesus. And so this is something I've said for years. You can always kind of divide human beings in lots of different ways in terms of personality. But this is one of my favorite ways of uh, understanding who we are as a personality. I always say there are two kinds of people. There are people who need to take up control in life, to take some control in their lives. And there are people who need to give up control in their lives. And you know which one you are, don't you? There are people uh, who need to give up control because these people think they're in charge of the world. They think they can take any situation and straighten it out. They sometimes tend to be anxious people, but they're not scared of anything. They are always swinging at the ball, right? I learned the lesson well. And then there are people who need to gain some control in life. They're overly passive. They sit around and say, well, God will take care of this, or maybe somebody else will take care of this. Well, let's just let this go another day. They tend to be procrastinators. And listen, all of us, all of us fall in one of those two categories. And you know who you are. And if you don't, just ask your wife. And she'll tell you, or your husband, or your best friend, and they'll tell you. Some of us need to learn the art of giving up control. Some of us need to learn the art of turning loose and letting go and allowing God to have a circumstance. That's what this passage is about. This relationship between Jesus and this man, he says, you have more power in life than you think you do. I don't need to reach out and touch you. If you want to be healed, just get up and move on. Almost all of you are 
familiar with a prayer that we call the serenity prayer. The serenity prayer, I've seen it written many, many times. It was uh, an anonymous. People think that it's anonymous. It's not anonymous. It was written by a man by the name of Reinhold Niebuhr. He was one of the greatest American theologians of the 20th century. He wrote it approximately in 1931, but it became famous because in 1941, the leaders of Alcoholics Anonymous discovered it. We have a slew of people in this church who are recovering alcoholics. And I'll guarantee you, every recovering alcoholic in America knows the serenity prayer, and most of them get up in the morning and they pray it because they have to. It's so easy to look at this prayer and and think, isn't that nice? But it really is. The reason I like the fact that it was written by Reinhold Niebuhr is because there's such deep theology implanted and reflected in the serenity prayer. Let's look at it quickly. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. That's for those who are overly active. And the courage to change the things I can. That's for everybody else, for this man at the pool at Bethesda. And the wisdom to know the difference. Let me ask you this question about that man. Which do you think it is? Was he lacking in courage or was he lacking in wisdom? Did he not know he had more power in his life or was he lacking the courage to be the person God had called him to be? That's an important question, isn't it? Because lying in the midst of that question is the art of living well, isn't it? The reason an alcoholic will pray that prayer every single day is because they know if they don't give, get up and give the day to God first, if they don't say, dear God, keep me sober this day. Dear God, give me the courage to do what I can do this day. Give, dear God, give me the wisdom to know what I cannot do this day. You see, they've already been to hell. That's why most alcoholics are so far ahead of the rest of us in terms of their spiritual journey. They've already been there. They already know that if you don't ask God for help with this issue, give me the wisdom to know where I can act and where I must wait for you. That's the art of living well. And I want to tell you something that I've learned in life. Every one of us struggle with the same spiritual issues that alcoholics do. The presenting issue may not be addiction, but the spiritual issue is always the same. It's the art of living, the art of somehow discovering the wisdom that helps us to know when and where we can act and when and where we must turn loose and let go and allow God to be in charge. When Jesus came along and he met the disciples, What was really life-changing about that for them was that they they didn't really understand who he was. There was so much mystery about this man. They had no idea really that he was the son of God. They had no understanding about what lay in front of them, the cross or the grave or the resurrection. What they did understand was that they had met someone who had a vision for life, someone who understood that life belongs to God and that we are merely God's actors. And when they decided to follow him, they didn't know they would go to Jerusalem, to the cross, or to the open grave. But what they did know is that they would follow a man who would challenge them to live powerful lives, acting where they could, and turning loose and letting go, and giving to God where they couldn't. 
One of the things I love about the serenity prayer is the ending of the serenity prayer because it places the context for everything. And some of you have never read it. So I'm going to read for you the entire serenity prayer and we'll close with this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time as we are all called to do, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it be, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the life to come. The art of living well, powerful lives that make a difference. May it be so for you and me. May it be so for you and me. Amen.